Hi, and welcome to the future of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Uh, today we have myself, Tasha Drew. I am the co-chair of the multi-tenancy working group, and I work in the office of the CTO in the advanced technology group at VMware. And Adrian? Hi, my name is Adrian Ludwin. Uh, I am the lead developer of hierarchical namespace controller as a, a project of the multi-tenancy working group, and I work on GKE at Google. Hi, uh, this is Fei I'm from Alibaba. I work on the Alibaba Cloud Container Service Team. So I was leading the virtual cluster project in the, this working group. And hey, folks, this is Jim Baguadia, co-founder at Nirmata. I contribute in the multi-tenancy working group. I'm a co-chair of the policy working group and also a maintainer of Kiverno. So a quick overview of what we do in the Kubernetes multi-tenancy working group. Um, so we are working on defining the, the models of multi-tenancy Kubernetes will dis support, discussing and executing upon work that needs to be done to support these models, creating conformance tests that prove models can be built and used in production environments. Um, I'm the chair along with Sanjeev Rampal. And the projects that we've been incubating and actually graduated two of these are the virtual cluster project, the hierarchical namespace controller, and the multi-tenancy benchmark project. Uh, you can see all of those in our GitHub repo, Kubernetes-6. Some of them have graduated to their own repos, but you can find quick links to those in our, in our main GitHub. If you want to talk with any of us about ideas or questions you have around multi-tenancy or projects you may be working on yourselves that you'd like to talk about potentially incubating or, or partnering with us on, um, we're very active in Slack. Uh, and if you want to attend our meetings and see our mailing list, then the only thing you need to do is um, join this Google group that is linked right here. We have meetings every two weeks, Tuesday at 11 a.m. Uh, once you join the Google group, you'll have access to our agenda document that you can add agenda items to our meetings that will address uh, as time permits based on how many uh, topics we have. And we really encourage people to join, chat with us, and check out our code. Um, so moving into the main content of today's chat, um, what we're going to be doing is a roundtable with myself, Adrian, Faye, and Jim around the future of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Um, so we're gonna kick off with just talking about why is multi-tenancy important and what patterns do we see? Um, Adrian, would you like to kick off? Sure, so the, there's mainly, as I see, two main advantages to multi-tenancy. One is simply the cost savings. Um, it is a lot cheaper if you have shared infrastructure to share it among lots of different tenants, whether those tenants are um, different teams at a single company, which is to say people who are directly using Kubernetes, or whether those tenants are SaaS consumers, which is to say um, uh, they're people who don't know that they're using Kubernetes, they're just using some app, and it makes no difference to them what it's running on, but the, the SaaS producer, the vendor, has chosen to use Kubernetes. Um, so multi-tenancy both gives you cost savings because things like the control plane and the individual nodes can get shared between different tenants, and it can also, in some cases, give you a, um, a management um, cost savings as well because it's easier to manage them all together. Now, that can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Sometimes it can be harder if your goal is to isolate tenants from each other as much as possible. Sometimes it can be harder to isolate them than it is in, on, uh, within one cluster. And so I think we'll probably get to that. But in my mind, those are the two sort of key use cases, multi-team and SaaS. Um, and and the benefits are cost savings and uh, maybe more marginally administrative savings. Awesome. Uh, so I think that's a pretty complete uh, description. So we'll move into just talking about what support exists for multi-tenancy in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Faye, uh, what support do you see in the Kubernetes ecosystem for multi-tenancy? Um, yeah, I think I think the we we. We, we have uh, quite a few uh, existing solutions for multi-tenancy. So as some of the post, blog posts we were hosting to the Kubernetes blog, so we define as a namespace as a service, one first one, and uh, we have a, a classic cluster as a service. Uh, we also have a new, like the control plan as a service. So we have different models to support uh, multi-tenancy. Um, um, we, we, so we be beyond on this three uh, concept we use. So the, the, the community actually developing um, different solutions, but following the same concept. For example, uh, Loft has bring up a V cluster, uh, which conceptually very close to uh, what your cluster we are proposing in this working group. 
and uh, we can we have uh, uh, another effort called Capsule, which is close to the concept of uh, hierarchical namespace uh, developed in our working group. So that's so so in summary. So I think we have quite a few uh, quite a lot of solutions built around of the concept we we already mentioned in our blog. So uh, maybe. Uh, Jim or Andre, you want to bring more uh, details for those projects? If you have more to add, Jim? yeah, certainly. So I think um, you know, just in addition to some of those projects, some different patterns that we also see, and there was a recent blog post also put out in the community where folks were talking about you know using policy engines or admission controllers and, and being able to uh, inject node selectors, etc to isolate workloads or uh, to get, you know, sort of stronger isolation for different tenants, right? But going back to the two major use cases that Adrian talked about, um, I, I think, you know, where you have internal teams either sharing entire uh, clusters through namespaces as a service or, you know, getting their own control planes or just doing clusters as a service through cloud providers and cloud provider integrations. Um, those seem to be well-established patterns, and there's tools and solutions for those. Um, and, and of course, if you want something additional, you would have to look at securing your data plane, um, which is also an important topic. And I think what I'd add to that is like, I mean, it's not as though Kubernetes has no features for multi-tenancy, like even the basics such as namespaces are back, network policies, um, um the quota like these are all building blocks that are in upstream kubernetes that were designed to make it easier to share a cluster among tenants whether those tenants are teams or SaaS consumers or even different workloads that are run by the same team um but yeah there is this kind of explosion of of options that are in the community one of them is the project that i started hierarchical namespaces which as the name implies is trying to take um, a, a fairly well-established construct from upstream case, which is namespaces, and just add a couple of features on them to make them more usable in more contexts. And we're getting some pretty good adoption there. Uh, Mercari actually just announced that they're using us in prod. Um, and we've got some other people, some other large companies on Slack who have been uh, openly contributing. I haven't got their permission, so I probably shouldn't say their name, but you'll see them if you join us on Slack. Um, and so it's clear that these additions are meeting a need. Um, but I think that if you look back at you know, the first question, what are the patterns? We haven't seen a lot of new patterns show up. What we've seen are like in these two established patterns, we've seen people with different needs at the margins, but they've kind of settled into, as both Faye and Jim have said, sort of these three classic solutions. One of them is based on namespaces. One of them is based just on multi-cluster, and then the last one is based on virtual clusters, which is basically you run multiple control planes within one you know, uh, overarching cluster. Um, and so I, I would say at this point, even though there's a lot of different solutions, they've all kind of coalesced into one of those three um, know, groupings, which is nice because it, it shows the maturation of multi-tenancy in the ecosystem. What do you think about uh multi-tenancy at the data plane. Is that something that this team should be addressing? Yeah, I think I think uh, it is, to be honest, it's, it's a pretty difficult problem com compared to isolating the control plane because of the, all the trivial and the importance because it will impact production. That's in the worst case, you did something wrong, uh, you, you got cat uh, catastrophic results. Um, uh, 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 I think as a best practice, um, when we're talking about if you want to support in using multi-tenancy solution to support uh, internal team, that's probably okay with native runtime solution uh, su support. But if you go beyond that, uh, we, we kind of hard, uh, highly recommend to use you know, sandbox runtime to prevent any tenant to get root access to the node. Um, uh, I think Kata is one of the solutions on the market. Uh, Andrew, maybe you can mention generally describe the divisor, which is how Google use this. Yeah, certainly the control, the, the control plane is hard to isolate and the data plane in some ways is even harder because at least the control plane is fully, like the, the attack service is the Kubernetes API server, whereas the data plane, the attack service is all of Linux or all of the underlying OS, which is obviously significantly bigger. Um, and so, 
Yeah, as Faye said, if if you were trying to do multi-tenancy within, let's say, one company and the teams pretty much trust each other and you're not expected to be actively you know, malicious towards one another, uh, then securing the data plane might be important but not critical. Uh, and maybe you get away fine with you know, network policies or Istio mesh uh, to control the communication, but you're not really worried about one team sort of like trying to break out of their container and attack others. If you're a little bit worried about that, then yeah, you can use tools such as Gvisor uh, or Kata Container. So Gvisor is a sandbox that's designed to work well on Kubernetes. Um, and uh, as much as possible, it's just you basically set a new runtime class in um, for your pod, and you just get the sandbox. And as long as you don't use an unsupported feature like certain system calls or GPUs, uh, everything should just work, maybe at a slight performance penalty. Um, however, if you really are worried about tenants attacking each other maliciously, that's when you want to, that's when you should at least consider simply using different clusters for everybody. Um, it's the, the amount of work that it takes to go through to harden Kubernetes is not impossible. People do do it. Um, but you have to be very clear on what you're getting for that. Is the cost savings really worth it? Is the is the management savings really worth it? If not, um, especially if you're using a cloud provider, uh, it might be worth your while to go off and just give everybody their own cluster. If you're managing the hardware yourself, on the other hand, you're, it'll look quite different, and you might want to start looking at sandboxing uh, technologies. But that's a more specialized use case, and one that it's hard to give general advice on, other than protect your, your traffic flows and and uh, use a sandbox. Yeah, so the one other sort of intermediate solution would also be to you know share the control plane using some of the best techniques, uh, best practices, et cetera, but then isolate each tenant. And again, this goes back to if you're a SaaS provider with multiple customers, so each tenant could get their own nodes, right? So you're not sharing the nodes, you're isolating tenants and nodes, you're taking advantage of things uh, either in the VM layer or the node layer or the OS layer itself. For that isolation, um, as opposed to you know uh, Gvisor or Kata containers or other solutions, so yeah, certainly all th all three options are would be interesting to look at in that you know SaaS provider type use case. Uh, so, yeah, I guess well, another another possibility is just use you know a service runtime if if people like. Yeah, it's funny. We don't have anybody uh, from the EKS team here, but uh, <laughs> that you can use. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Azure has something similar, but you can use Fargate as a backend if you're on EKS. Um, and that then you're relying, at least for your runtime security, you're relying on Fargate managing your multi-tenancy and not your own VM, um, like not your own VM setup. Now, if that's what you have, if you're doing, you better really understand what the multi-tenancy implications are of Fargate, which I don't. I don't work on it. I'm not an expert. But that now becomes part of your security story. But I think in some cases, using some sort of serverless solution um, could be another potential path, depending on uh, your vendor and your, your comfort with different security risks. Cool. So as you look at both what the working group has accomplished and the different data plane and control plane uh, concerns there. Do you see anything that needs to be added to upstream um, that uh, kind of, and I thought Faye might have some interesting thoughts around this. Yeah, so to be honest, so so when we when we, when we we think about how to resolve the multi-tenancy problem in the Kubernetes, the first you know, option that the community of mine is try that upstream to support it. Uh, but we, we have tried and we talked to different people. Uh, so we have so many um, we are so many things need to be re-architected and people kind of reluctant to do that in terms of the accountability issues. Um, but luckily in the community, so we have some attempts in the community people, there is a project called Actos and, uh, that in that project, uh, the developer actually introduced a new API concept called tenant built on top of the, the namespace. Basically, uh, if you look at, looking at the object the full name there is a piece of name called tenant so uh, that that model kind of nicely resolved many of our use cases in, in terms of isolation in terms of the uh, self-service namespace creation even crd supports 
but uh, there is one big problem is that you have to almost all plugin has to be changed so this has very big impact on the ecosystem so uh, based on my understanding because this drawback of the adoption uh, I, I think the actual people finally decide don't do that they will do something more similar like the control plan as a service type of uh, solution to resolve their multi-tenancy use cases so that's at least one attempt that i have seen so, yeah, what, one thing that I've definitely seen uh, within the multi-tenancy working group is we often um, start collaborating with research universities who've started looking into hardening multi-tenancy um, within Kubernetes as an academic project um, and just kind of a research effort. Um, and the one thing that I kind of want to, that we've had like some interesting conversations around is um, the, the big part of the value in consuming Kubernetes is being able to stay up with current releases. Um, so that you're staying in lockstep with the vendors that are providing services on top of Kubernetes and all of the capabilities and ecosystem around Kubernetes. Um, and so that's actually a pretty big endeavor. And so if you're kind of looking at current today, any given release of Kubernetes and saying, hey, I'm just going to take this and harden it, keep in mind that if you can't continue to consume updates um, and if you can't stay current with the latest releases, um, what you have ends up starting to look like a hardened fork that isn't compatible with the rest of the ecosystem. So keeping upgrades in mind, it's, it's a lot of work, but it ends up being a pretty crucial component of a solution you might add here. Um, so the... <laughs> I think that one thing that comes up consistently when we're talking about this space is should we change the Kubernetes API to be secure, like hardened multi-tenancy by default, right? And that's a huge lift and a big architectural change on the back end. But it is a question that has come up in a lot of our meetings. Um, I guess kind of I'll, I'll pass this one to Jim. Jim, do you think that there's appetite in the users of Kubernetes for like that kind of massive API change? So I think the value of that change is understood, but the challenge, like Faye was also mentioning, especially with like the project that tried, you know, adding tenants or the tenant information to the APIs, is what it would do to the compatibility of other add-ons, other solutions that are really built on uh, Kubernetes, right? So at this point, at least, you know, like it seems like it would have to be a breaking change. And since Kubernetes, the core APIs are GA, they're, um, you know, kind of, um, they're not to, man to manage compatibility. There's no easy way to introduce that change uh, into Kubernetes APIs itself, right? Uh, however, one other area, and speaking of, you know, add-ons, so Kubernetes today, you know, if you're implementing or using Kubernetes, it's a collection of projects. I and mean, obviously there's a control plane, there's, uh, but there's several other components, several other add-ons that need to be run uh, to be able to, you know, get uh, have Kubernetes uh, clusters operationalized within an enterprise. So from that point of view, there are projects like if you look at uh, DNS, right? So every Kubernetes cluster runs DNS, uh, requires DNS, and, and DNS is not tenant aware. So those sort of changes, in my opinion, and, and making something like core DNS tenant aware is certainly you know, feasible and seems like that could be done uh, or other DNS you know, projects can offer that into Kubernetes uh, to add you know, better tenancy constructs and isolation and segmentation, even within namespaces. Adrian, if we were going to do something to make multi-tenancy easier to use, what should it be? Well, easier to use. Um, so yeah, I think that I, I'll agree with what Jim and Faye have just said. It's like, I don't think that there's a lot of value in making large changes to upstream at this point. Like, it's really nothing breaking. Um, because the fact that we have been able to implement things like HNC and B cluster shows that there's a reasonable path forward that I think is probably good enough, given the, the traction that the current Kubernetes API has. Um, and it's not worthwhile um, to, to rip that all up. Now, let's say that, so HNC is, as I mentioned, it's getting hierarchical namespaces are getting good adoption. And by design, they've been designed to be additive on top of current ones. So let's say that you know three or five years from now, um, we're seeing a large percentage of people using it. We could add that to upstream. Um, and that would improve the usability because it's one less component to build to, to add on. But on the other hand, 
most people are going to install lots of components anyway, whether it's a policy component such as Caverno or Gatekeeper or, um, um, or Core DNS or you know, a, a network plugin. So already, um, you've got an overall usability story that, that you have to answer for Kubernetes, and multi-tenancy is just one part of that story. Um, and so I think that that's really the way to look at this as we go forward to make it easier to use. We really need to start shifting away from the technical solutions because I think that we are we have either plugged those holes with the projects that we've incubated or are plugging those holes, or at least we know where the holes are and we can point people to like, yeah, let's go work on core DNS for a bit. Let's go figure out how you get across different network partitions using QProxy or something like that. Once you have that, um, if you've got somebody who's coming in who doesn't know Kubernetes um, and they need to look at this universe, I think we've all seen the chart of CNCF projects that looks like a, the RA chart from hell. What they really need is a guide, right? Um, and what you need are best practices, um, documentation, possibly, um, well, for the vendors, you can actually have wizards and whatnot, but any kind, uh, something that can just get people onto the right path. So it really does become a usability and documentation question. And I think that I can see that as being, by and large, the future of multi-tenancy and Kubernetes is not new technologies, but new ways to help people use them. Thanks for that bridge. Um, so just to kind of wrap up and really answer the question that we posed uh, in this session, uh, what is the future of multi-tenancy? Um, Jim, what, what do you see here? Yeah, so certainly as, as Adrian was also just pointing out, right, I mean, there's, there's still work to be done in some areas, uh, there, but the core, um, I guess the building blocks seem to be in place, right? And there are enough usable tools and we're also seeing uh, like some of the tools we mentioned, like Loft and Capsule and others emerging from both vendors in the ecosystem, uh, as well as as open source projects, right? So at this point, um, you know, th the, the work that seems to be left to be done is go address some of these, you know, smaller remaining issues like we talked about, whether it's with DNS or perhaps with the Coop proxy and a few other things, which could be made tenant aware uh, without changing the guts of uh, Kubernetes itself. Uh, and, and then, you know, the, uh, sort of that evangelism or awareness or better classification of how uh, users and enterprises can map their use cases back to, you know, what needs to be done in multi-tenancy. So uh, it seems like there are, you know, and within the uh, Kubernetes community itself, um, you know, like there's several, of course, there's SIG usability, there's SIG networking, there's the policy working group. So those could be areas of collaboration when some outreach into those streams to see whether they, you know, these other projects as they graduate and mature, whether they fit in well and to carry forward some of the work that we've started here. Thanks. Uh, Faye, uh, what are your thoughts around the future of multi-tenancy? Yeah, uh, I think I do agree, Andrew and James point. I don't, I don't have too much to add, uh, I guess. Um, so as a working group, we certainly welcome any people if you come with this new idea to first point out the challenges that you are facing, uh, point out the problem that you think is not in the Kubernetes, but it's not uh, what you can see ready. So let's see if we can have something new. Uh, maybe we are leaving our mind it because <laughs> uh, so it, it, I think as an open community, so we are certainly welcome anything. If you have some idea you want to do an incubation, we, we fully support your efforts. So uh, yeah, that, that's all. Awesome. Uh, any any closing thoughts, Adrian? Yeah, um, I, I think that as we said, like we set out, uh, I wasn't actually here when, when multi-tenancy working groups started, but my understanding is that we set out to find out like what are the patterns that need to be supported and what do we need to, to build or add to upstream or to the community um, in order to enable those. And I think that we've largely succeeded in that task. And so does the working group need to continue in its current form? Maybe uh, it is a nice landing place for people to come. Maybe we can set something up under SIG usability if the, uh, because SIGs of course are longer lived than working groups. Uh, maybe we can set something up as under SIG usability as that landing zone. Um, and I think that uh, we can discuss what the organization will be, but I'm feeling pretty good about what we've accomplished uh, in the couple of years since I, I joined this group. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for sharing your thoughts on the future of multi-tenancy and to the audience listening. Uh, if you have joined KubeCon Live, we will be taking audience questions, uh, both within the platform and in the CNCF chat, um, or you can come and join the Kubernetes uh, chat channel uh, for multi-tenancy, which we're in uh, outside of events too. So thanks. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts uh, and looking forward to more multi-tenant solutions. Woo. Thanks everyone. Thank you.